Good day, everybody, and welcome. Today is Tuesday, September the 6th, 2022, and this is day seven of my 77-day video challenge. I welcome you to a Tuesday. Now, there are friends of mine who are following me who actually live in time zones that are further ahead, as well as those of you who are actually a few hours behind me. For example, I have a friend in Palo Alto, California, who probably is just now getting her day started. She's a fellow Toastmaster. She is an advanced communicator, a distinguished Toastmaster, a superb communicator. And she's joining me this morning. And then I have a very, very good friend who is in Bangladesh, who is following me this morning and is an individual that not only follows me, but also provides me with outstanding feedback because she has great insights into the value and hopefully the importance of these messages to you based upon my thematic elements, which are, of course, my niche, which I don't think I've ever told you before. I never noticed in that story, as well as my power word for living, resolve. Then in addition to that, there are family members this morning my son and daughter-in-law are with us today. My son's already online and working after an interesting thing, three weeks of leave from the company that he works with, paid leave to be able to be in the bonding process with his wife and their newborn daughter. That to me is an incredibly astonishing thing and more and more companies are doing that. So I'm thankful that he works for a company that cares enough about the family unit they allow individuals in a family situation to be able to have paid time based upon their tenure with the company and be able to have that bonding mechanism. And I think that's fantastic. But in addition to that, my daughter-in-law's family who live in the islands of the Philippines, and a big shout out this morning, by the way, to all of you in the Philippines who are on Iloilo. There is a city of about 350,000 people that is sort of like, I guess you could say, the capital city. It's definitely a major city, and it's called Iloilo City. And that, of course, is where they live, at least close by, but they live more out in the country. But to Melrose, Saitong, and all of the family over there, my in-laws through my beautiful daughter-in-law, by now... It's beginning to be late in your day. It's evening there. I'm, I'm looking, at, for example, right now, it's almost 10 a.m. here in central Florida, USA, in the Eastern Daylight Time. Over there, it's actually almost 10 p.m. on the evening of Tuesday. So they're wrapping up their day. So you see, the beauty of technology, the beauty of streaming technology, Facebook, the web, and so many, many other things is the capacity to connect with people from points all over the globe. And because of YouTube, to be able to save these videos, I have a video channel, which I would like you to go up to like and subscribe to. And in addition to that, these videos are a part of my library of videos and archived. And if you ever go in there and take a look, you're going to see some interesting things. If you wanna get an idea of the history of my journey, and I never noticed, and even my history coming up to and now with my power word for living resolve, you have to go back and look at those first podcast videos, as well as those video presentations that I did, where I talked about those circumstances that began back with the death of my father in 2010, the Alzheimer's explosion with my mother in 2011, and the struggle that we had in trying to get control of the situation where mom was being preyed upon by incredibly evil people. I mean, literally evil. That's a story that hopefully maybe one of these days I can put into the form of a book, which by the way, reminds me, my book, Resolve, and there will be a tagline, but I haven't come up with that tagline just yet. But in that book, I talk about how these seven letters that make up this word resolve are very important when you look at a specific definition. To kind of tell you, and I'm gonna be talking about service in just a minute because that's letter number three. The whole subject of why my wife and I chose Resolve goes back to a question that we had been grappling with for a long time when we were coming down to the end of 2017. 
we made resolutions, but we didn't keep resolutions. Sometimes we got off to a good start, best of intentions, and we all do it. And I know there are statistical numbers out there that tell us that there's a percentage of people that keep their resolutions. There's a percentage of people that keep some of their resolutions. There's a percentage of people that might keep one of those resolutions. And then, of course, there's a significant percentage of people who try resolutions and just quit and never finish. And then there are those who simply say, what's the use? Throw your hands up and get. And my wife and I had pretty much thrown our hands up and just got on with living. We just got away from it. And then as we were talking about a power word, we suddenly began to realize that all of this had to do with starting the new year. And we didn't want to set resolutions. We wanted to do something far more intentional. And so finally, we kept coming back to resolutions. And of course, the root word of resolutions is resolve. And you can do resolve in a lot of different definitions, but the definition that we found was resolve is having a definite, note I said definite, that's in the dictionary, having a definite plan of action. A definite plan of action is still something that you have to do, but because you put that additional adjective, that modifier on it, you begin to understand that this is not something that you hope to do. This is not something that you're just going to try to do. This is not something that you're going to give it your best effort and hope that you get it done. This is an intentional, firm decision, a definite, firm plan of action to be carried out and accomplished. There are in the journey to reaching that plan and its end result, intermediate steps along the way. There are immediate things that must be done. There are short-term expectations. Then there are intermediate expectations and there are long-term expectations. And these are also subject to being amended or modified or adjusted. Sometimes they need to be stepped back and looked at and determined we need to replace it with this or we need to make this adjustment or we just need to discard it entirely because as we have moved forward, it does, it no longer has application. It no longer has usefulness. But throughout the process, in order to get to the end point, you must along the way meet specific expectations and you must step back evaluate review adjust and make whatever plans necessary to change to keep towards the goal of reaching that absolute definite firm plan of action and the end result it's talked about and Anyone who talks in motivation and goal setting will tell you about that. And this is something that almost subconsciously we do anyway, because there are certain things we just automatically do. There's the automatic of getting up every day, and there are just certain things we do when we first get up. Like, for example, for me, when I get up and I get myself together, the first thing I do is I grab one of my favorite coffee mugs, an orange coffee mug. I'm wearing an orange shirt today. And I make myself a cup of coffee. Now, sometimes I'll brew a pot of coffee if I have a particular type of coffee that I love. And for example, right now I do have pumpkin spice coffee. However, this morning I just fired up my Keurig and I have some variety of flavors that I buy through Amazon. And I brewed myself a cup of coconut mocha. Yep, that's right, coconut mocha. And before you go, Ugh, do you know that the... Um, what is it? I forget the name of it now, but it's the Christmas blend. I think it's Santa's blend or something like that, that Barney's coffee makes. Uh, it has coconut in it. And it's surprising. These coffees are not sweet. They just have these very various flavor essences that give them an aroma that is really lovely. But also, too, they're made with very, very fine beans that have been 
grown in areas of the world where great coffee beans are grown. They're usually probably in the greatest percentage Arabica. And then, of course, the roasting of that bean. I mean, is it a light roast, a medium roast, a dark roast, an espresso roast, which is in in a particular time, espresso can be an incredible experience as a cup of coffee. So I enjoy my coffee. But I'll get up and I'll make that cup of coffee. I've already had a cup this morning. I've already had uh, my time of devotions with friends where I have these uh, devotions that I receive from a wonderful lady up in Lake County in the villages. And um, not only do I enjoy her devotional reading, but I share it with 20 other people. And I enjoy doing that because it's a it's a good way to start the day, and it puts me in the right perspective based upon the value system that I have, the faith that I live by. But I'm not here to talk about my faith. Let's get around to something, though, that I think is used in the area of faith, but it's also used in the area of work. It's used in the area of community service. It's just, well, the word is service, service. Now, <clears throat> there are a multitude of definitions for service. And in its simplest form, it's simply putting yourself out there ready to do whatever's necessary to help with a particular situation to make that situation the best possible outcomes. Service is part of a job. I came out of, well, but even before I came out of college, I worked in service jobs. When I was still in high school, and I'm going back to the 1960s, back in the day when McDonald's restaurants, you walked up to windows and you were outside ordering through a little window like you would if you were going to a Dairy Queen. And also, too, the menu was extraordinarily small. They, in 1966, when I started working for McDonald's, in the Chattanooga area, and there was one in East Ridge, I sold up at the front and sometimes I worked behind in the grill area cooking burgers or fries or dropping filet o fish into the grease to be cooked. And of course there was a prep station. In the service work, meeting the customer was the most direct method, and that was where the income was produced. And people would come up, and we sold a basic hamburger, a cheeseburger, a filet of fish French fries, three flavors of soda, and three types of milkshakes. And that was the menu at McDonald's. And in that particular day, if we sold $200 worth of food in an hour, that was astonishing. But you have to remember, in 1966 and 67, the dollar went a whole lot farther than it goes today. And these, these burgers were as cheap as like 35 cents. A cheeseburger, maybe 45 cents. The fries were like uh, 25 or 35 cents. I, I don't even remember. I just know that you could feed a whole family for five bucks. So this was the situation I was in, but it was a service job. And you got to know people and you met people of all types and variations and you were serving them. You were getting their order. You were providing them with what they want. And if they had a problem, they came up, you immediately got a manager up there, an assistant manager up there to help them. When I was in college, I was working for a freight line company called Roadway Express. Now, although I was not dealing in direct customer service, I was serving the customer because my job was to make sure that the, the freight, the boxes, the shipments were being handled properly, whether they were being unloaded off of trucks to be shipped, to be delivered into the metropolitan area, or whether this was manufacturers in the area who had products that need to be put onto a truck to be taken out on long haul. And so working for Roadway Express, I had a job that was basically heavy lifting, but I was still providing a service. There was a customer component built into that, and that was handle the freight properly because freight is more than just a truck driver and a truck. 
when I was in college, I had some service jobs, but I spent a lot of time working on campus for the campus radio station, and that was a lot of fun for me to do. But as I progressed over the four years in college, I moved into a position of leadership and became a student station manager. And as a student station manager, I had to not only serve the group of public that we were reaching through our campus radio station and its outreach, but also I had to serve the people working at the station to know when they were to work, what their schedule was, what were the important things they needed, what training they required, and it was a lot of fun. And then I went into the service industry when I graduated from college initially working for retail. And I worked for retail for a number of years. These were big box department stores. And back in the day, they were the king. I can remember growing up with Sears and Roebuck. But when I graduated from college, the up and comer, the one that was growing faster than any of them was Kmart. <clears throat> and Kmart, by the way, was simply a massive retail discount store, as they called it which was an extension of the S.S. Kresge company based in Michigan. Many things have changed over the years, but the service industry is still the service industry, and there is still this walk up and you get service. And that service comes in many ways. And you have people online who give you service by phone. You have people that give you service through a chat feature on your computer. But service can be so much more than that. And for me, over the years, what's happened in my journey is that serving people expressly for the purposes of helping them become successful and achieving success, achieving a greater quality of life, achieving a better standard of living, or just simply achieving goals that they desire to reach, but perhaps maybe they don't think they're good enough to do it. In that service component, there is also a measure of mentoring. Mentoring being you have skills that you share with them and you come alongside and you let your skills be something that they can tap into as they are discovering what really is their fit in terms of their gifts and their skills and their shortcomings. Then there is a coaching aspect. And in that aspect, this is more about you've got a teaching mechanism going on where you're showing tools in order to be more successful. And you're plotting out strategy to help the individual or individuals be more successful by setting up a game plan, plotting a strategy, or even running a play. But all of this is a coaching factor. And coaching sometimes requires a certain degree of get up in someone's grill, as they like to say in football, and tell them, you can do better than that. Get your head together. Get your focus together. Execute and stay mentally and physically disciplined. This is, again, all part of the process of helping people be successful in creating a successful environment. So here we are. All of these things are tied to service. And I believe in every single one of them. And I believe that service can be an amazing thing. And when you get good service, you really stop and take note. I will say this. I strongly believe that in the world of service, if you're sent a survey asking you for feedback about a service that you received, whether it was in a store or whether it was online or in any other type of a situation that you're in, I believe you should answer the survey. And the reason why is twofold. One, I feel the people doing the job need to be recognized for a job well done when they do a job that is well done. I also believe that sometimes you have to point out that there were problems. Now, does that mean that the organization, the management actually is going to read your comments? Some do, some don't. 
there's an adage that says the squeaky wheel gets the grease. And I do know that if enough people make enough noise, the noise is going to get the attention of the people who could possibly do something about it. I also know that in many service situations, depending upon what we're talking about, and I'm not going to start naming specific classification groups, they don't care about service. They do it as just a matter of process, but as far as looking and reading and internalizing and thinking about how can we fix this, they generally don't. And then there are some organizations which could care less. And if you call them up with a problem, you actually get a very, very sometimes surly, difficult, and even mean-spirited person who's going to say, you are totally wrong. This call is ending. Goodbye. Click. <laughs> it's happened to me on more than a few occasions, but let me be honest with you. There's been times in service where I, in many ways, have done the same thing. I've been dismissive. But in the service area, when we're talking about humanity and the people that we meet on a day-to-day -day basis, here's something I want you to understand as a precursor. You have gifts, you have abilities, you have skill, you have knowledge. And then all of that has to be filtered through a personality. Some people have great personalities. Some people have okay personalities. Some people have significant personality difficulties. There are emotions involved in this process. And those emotions can respond in different kinds of ways, depending upon the environment that you grew up in and the situations that you've been exposed to. And you will find yourself being reactive and a reactive personality can be negative at times. As a matter of fact, usually reactiveness does create a negative vibe. It would mean conflict. It's kind of like, you know, you butt heads with a person. To be able to step back and look at a situation and say, how can I better serve this individual? What do I need to be looking for? You have to have this ability and you don't naturally possess it. You have to work at it. You have to train it. You have to nurture it. You have to grow it. You have to make it a part of who you are. It becomes built in through habit. And that is you set aside your preconceived notions, your bias and your other things that you do. You set aside your, you know, the fact that you want to get your work done and you don't really want to be bothered by this. The last thing you want to do is have somebody upset with you and blaring away in your ear. But you have to set it aside and you have to focus down and focus down and listen to them. You have to keep your mouth shut. And I've always told people, I said, well, if you want to jump in because there's something about a statement they said that's wrong, write it down. Don't interrupt because interrupting only creates acrimony and acrimony can lead to an increased level of uh, temper and an increased level of temper. It's going to result in, in conflict, and that conflict is going to be oral, or if it's in a public venue, that conflict could get volatile. Now, I'm not trying to talk about worst-case scenarios, but service also is about how you want to see other people accomplish the objectives that they believe they want to achieve, and they hope to reach and find a way to the dreams that they have in their life. Service is about taking what you've been blessed with through the giving and caring of other people and through the natural gifts that you have and those gifts that you've been given that you have honed into great skills. And then you're saying to yourself, how can I help this individual find their way to their goals, beginning with the first one, then the second, and always there to step up alongside them and bring them on the way, and when asked, to give them recommendations and ideas to help them do a better job at what they're doing and to correct mistakes and deficiencies. And most importantly of all, to tell them and take hold of this, this is important, that failure, or at least what we define as failure, is a very harsh word. Failure is not the end. Failure is not the ultimate defeat. 
there are times when there is a complete and utter total defeat. It's a failure. It's over. It's not going to happen again. There's no sense trying. That's not the case here. All the great people who have talked about motivation and have talked about putting forth the best possible effort in life to get things done will tell you that they have failed many times. They have failed sometimes hundreds of times. But the failures were designed to eliminate the things that didn't work and narrow down until they found what would work and did work. There's a plethora of stories out there that will talk about this aspect. In service, when you are serving people and you are wanting them to be successful, and that's an important thing, or you want to understand what their passion is and what they believe in and be willing to listen and say, okay, for me, this works. I don't know that that would work for me, but that doesn't mean it couldn't work for you. The point being, I've listened, I've heard, I understand. If you'll permit me, let me offer you a couple of recommendations that may help you better achieve that goal. I think our evaluation and feedback process in Toastmasters is one of the most amazing processes that you'll ever see. And although it's a Toastmasters thing, it's been utilized throughout many, many great success stories. Dale Carnegie taught this to people. This sandwich, as we like to call it, when someone is standing up there, taking a huge risk, speaking in front of a group of people, sharing their heart, their original story. They're not up there speaking for the purposes necessarily of entertaining people, but they do want to give a good presentation and they want to show that they have the capacity to learn, to grow, and to get better. It does them no good if they receive some smiles, a little bit of applause, and then we just say, okay, we'll look forward to hearing you again very, very soon. Next project. There has to be an evaluation and feedback process where the individual has one person or persons who step in and say, all right, I noticed that you did this and you did that well. I noticed some other things that you could improve upon. And then I noticed some things that I could tell you were struggling with and that you felt uncertain if you could do it. Let me first of all tell you, this is just me expressing to you what I saw, what I heard and what I felt. As a service to you, if you would like, I can give you a couple of recommendations of what worked for me when I ran into the very, very same problem. And at the end of the day, that's going to take them a lot farther along than sitting down in front of them saying, you did this wrong, you did this wrong, you did this wrong. That doesn't help. We all know we mess up. There has never been a speech that I've ever given in the communications field where at the end of the speech, I thought back about what I said and I said, darn it, I missed that. I forgot to say that. It could have been so much better if I had said that. The truth is, there is never a perfect speech. The truth is, as good as you get, you can still get better. What's the purpose of going into any kind of a learning opportunity? If you walk away with nothing new at the end that has been added to the quality of your life and the progress on your road to greater success. Let's get real when it comes to serving people. If you are a self-centered, egotistical individual and your sole purpose in being involved in something, no matter what it is, And Toastmasters out there, some of you, I hope, are listening to me right now. If it's just about you, you're never going to really be able to be the kind of service-minded individual that I think a great Toastmaster should be. You're never going to be able to offer ideas for improvement. You're never going to be able to offer encouragement. All you're going to do is just be critical and say, nice try, but you're still not going to be able to do it as well as I do. Don't do as I say, do as I do. Or you can look at the individual and say, I felt you struggled. 
with a particular aspect of your presentation. And I know how that feels. I've felt the same way. I had it happen to me on more than a few occasions. So if you'll permit me, let me show you or share with you something that I found helped me to get better. And if you're willing to try it, it might just move you up a notch. Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing? But here's even more special why the service aspect of it is so essential. You show up the next time. You watch them perform. You see, hopefully, that step up or maybe even a leap up. And you celebrate and rejoice over the fact that they did it. And you let them know, congratulations, it worked. Keep doing it. If there's anything else that I can help you with, ask me. I love watching your success. It's a thrill to see you succeed. Sometimes the simplest little things can give you the most tremendous rush of joy. I will tell you one more story. And then I'm going to conclude. And I've been talking about service. And have you noticed that the thread in this particular aspect of serving people is a very selfless thread? Remember what I said, what Zig Ziglar said. You'll get everything you want in life as long as you help other people get what they want in life. That's, that's, a, that's, that's a paraphrase. It's not exactly by quote, but you've heard that story. Several years back, when I was involved heavily in competitive speaking, I had competed on the, well, I'm actually in the international speech contest for Toastmasters, reached the division level. And I finished runner up on the division level. So I didn't win the division. I didn't get to go to the district competition. The young lady that beat me had a fantastic speech. Both of our speeches, I know, were good. But at the end of the day, the judges saw in her speech a far better quality of presentation, entertainment, and all the various components that make for a well-prepared, well-written, and well-presented speech, and she won the division. I will also tell you that when she went to the district, she won the district. But here's the thing that actually just warmed my heart and almost brought tears to my eyes. She did the same speech she did that she won with in the division contest. But she added something. She didn't ask my permission, but frankly, I didn't care. Because sometimes what you have to realize is that we get good pieces of information that we can apply in our speeches by watching the best of the best as encouragement to all. And so one of the parts of my speech when I was talking about it and giving it in the competition on the division level I actually incorporated a physical part where I dramatically demonstrated that the blows that I took in life were so poundingly devastating that like a prize fighter, I was knocked to my knees. And I literally on the stage collapsed to my knees with my head down, feeling as if I couldn't get back up and that I was gonna be out for the count. In the district championship, she incorporated a similar body language, dramatic element. And what it did was it took her entire message to an even higher level. I was gratified and flattered that she saw something I did as beneficial to her taking her leap to the next level and winning. Some people would say, that's my move. Why did you do that? I'm jealous. Well, that's not plagiarizing. That move's been done thousands upon thousands of times in presentations. It's a dramatic element. But the very fact that I was able to do something which she was able to use, which ultimately I think had an important part in helping her to win, shot me through the roof with excitement and joy. I literally almost cried at just how effective and tender and wonderful it was and that she would flatter me by using something that I had done in order for her to garner that success. We're friends. She's great as a speaker. 
she didn't have nearly the experience I had, but she had incredible gifts. And on that particular evening, she was the best speech in the house, no questions asked. But for me, it was a service element. Maybe she didn't come to me and ask me, but the fact that she saw me as an example is another extension of personal service to people. You are who you are. And as Maggie Sabatier Smith says, and I've quoted Maggie many times, show up as who you are. Show up as who you are. Let that be the signal to people that one, you're approachable. Two, you're unselfish. Three, you're ready to provide any kind of help that is possible. And four, that you want to celebrate other people's success. Selfless service. The letter S is the third letter in the word resolve. Selfless service is a behavioral trait that I feel in many cases is in short supply. So much so that in this day and age, I guarantee you when you go out in the midst of what you do, whether you work in an office, on the road, or whether you're out in the public doing your general things, when you see a person who operates with a service-minded, selfless attitude, you take notice and you find it as a moment where it raises the warmth inside your heart, puts a smile on your face, inspires you, and releases endorphins into you that help you to then take and carry that smile and that positivity and give it away to other people. Selfless service can be used in any type of a situation, whether intentionally or totally in a subconscious manner, but it's a practice that you must continually work on day after day after day. Stop, look, listen, keep your mouth closed, Learn what you need to know and then be willing to do anything you can to offer to help and to solve the problem or to say thanks or to help with fixing something or to step up and work alongside. All of these things are service related areas and you have the capacity to do just that sort of a thing. And you should apply that. Today, day seven of my 77 day video challenge. Thank you so much for joining me. And I look forward to seeing you again tomorrow on what will be September the 7th. It will be day eight. And yes, I will be traveling later this week, but I'll still be coming to you because I'll be using either my laptop with me on the road while I'm traveling, or I'll be coming to you by way of my smartphone. It is my intention, by the grace of God, to come to you every day. Please check me out on my YouTube channel under John Morrow, DTM. Also look me up on Facebook under John Morrow DTM, as well as my regular Facebook page that you're watching me on here. Please like, comment, and share. I appreciate your feedback. Right now, I'm sharing this with the general friends that I already have, and I really crave what you say and what you send to me and what advice and recommendations and feedback and thanks for improvement that you want to send along my way. After all, I'm still a work in progress. And for that, I thank you in advance for your service to me in a very unselfish and kind sort of way. Have a great day. It's Tuesday. Be blessed. Have fun. I look forward to seeing you tomorrow by the grace of God. But until then, John Morrow saying so long for now. And remember, slow down. Pay attention. Notice. And by all means, start your day every day with resolve.